wow, those spices, they really, they really get to you. Are you getting this action? It's a group effort making this happen. Hi, I'm Sola at the New York Times Cooking Studio, and this is our little mini-series on the basics of cooking, and this is the last episode. You made it. Today we're talking about beef. I'm gonna show you how to make a dish using ground beef, another one using short rib, which is typically a tough cut, but I'm gonna show you how to cook it real fast and a steak because you gotta learn how to make a steak and we're gonna show you how to make sure that you nail the cook on all three. Right now we're at Dixon's Farm Stand Meats. This is the butcher that I come to. I always prefer to come to the butcher for my meat rather than the grocery store because I know it's very fresh and you can get whatever you want. So I can ask for a steak, a specific thickness, they'll grind meat for you. So it's really great to come to a butcher. You can get exactly what you want and you know that you're getting something super fresh. Once you get to know your butcher, they're part of your family. What are the things that you're looking for in a steak? Complicated question with ribeyes because okay. it's also what you like. So this one is kind of where the ribeye is turning into a New York strip. So you have a really big eye and a smaller cap. So if you like more tender meat, that's the ribeye for you. If you like something with like bigger flavor and maybe tenderness is less your th like uh, important to you, one of those two back there, which has a bigger cap and a smaller eye and more fat, uh, that's basically where it's the ribeye is closer to the shoulder. So same steer, same rib, uh, different position. So kind of closer to the back of the animal, closer to the front. We call it like becoming more chucky. Oh, uh, like I didn't chuck. know this. I'm learning, I think I've picked the wrong ribeye before. <laughs> so there's kind of different parts of the short rib. The first uh, ribs are meatier. The other ones will be more fatty. You might want, depending on what you're making, maybe you, you want more bone to add to your broth. Uh, maybe you want more fat. Um, and other ones maybe you want to be meatier. The best thing to do is to talk to your butcher. Yes. We're gonna make a taco salad. I love taco salad. It was invented by the founder of Frito-Lay, originally for Disneyland, where they had a Frito restaurant. They were in like little cups and it was called a ta cup. Huh? This taco salad is just as easy to make. We don't have a big bowl. We're just gonna put all of our taco things on top of a bed of Fritos. I like to cook it in a cast iron skillet. I want to get really good color. So I've been preheating this while I've been talking to you. We know that it's nice and hot because it's starting to smoke. And I'm using a towel because the handle is very hot. Your cast iron is always very hot. Ground beef can be, mean a lot of things. If you just buy ground beef that says ground beef, classic. You don't totally know what's in there. It could be a mix of cuts, but oftentimes when you go to a butcher, it'll specify ground chuck, ground brisket, or like what's in the blend. And then besides that, the other thing to look out for is fat percentages. That tells you what the breakdown of meat to fat is. So something like an 80-20 is gonna have more fat, which means it's gonna brown a little bit better. That's like really nice for a burger. Something like 90-10 is gonna be leaner. I prefer to always go with an 80-20 when possible, because once you brown your meat, you can always just strain off that fat. The fat's gonna break out, but having it in there just really helps make sure that it's really nice and moist when you're cooking and that you get really good browning. When it comes to doneness on ground beef, I recommend that if you are buying from a butcher where you know that they're grinding it in-house in small batches, then it's okay if it's a little bit pink. If you're getting like pre-packed ground beef that's been ground in a large processing plant, the best move is always to cook it through. I'm gonna spread it in one even layer so I can maximize browning. I kind of like to make a giant bass burger. So I get really nice browning on one side, and then I'll go in there once I've got the color and break it up. At this point, I just want it in one flat layer. And then once I have one layer, I'm not gonna touch it. I'm not gonna touch it. Now, taking a cue from Smash Burger, I'm gonna add my onions right on top. So they're kind of like gonna steam from the moisture that's coming off the meat. And I'm gonna really generously salt, and then, gonna let it stay put and what's gonna happen is the meat is gonna get really really deeply browned on the bottom side but it's gonna stay moist it's a great way to make sure you maximize browning and flavor without drying out your meat the, I think the hardest part with this is you're gonna want to get in there and touch it but you don't don't touch it just like let it keep going it's gonna get really brown on the outside whoa let's see what's happening here Ooh. 
look at that. We got some color. You see that? It's still kind of pink and moist on top. If a lot of fat came out of your meat, now is the time to tip the skillet and scoop it out. I actually, I'm okay with how much fat's there. But this is, this is your taco salad. So if you wanna scoop that out, go for it. I'm gonna leave it in. So I'm gonna add my garlic now and my spices. So I wanna emphasize, this is not really Mexican, right? This is like, we're going for those Taco Bell flavors. So I feel like the key to achieving that, we've got a little oregano, cumin, and some chili powder. Not cayenne, not like guajillo, not ancho, nothing fancy, just like regular old chili powder. And that's how you get that American taco salad vibe. I'm gonna get in and now I'm gonna break it up and spices are gonna bloom in the fat. Our garlic's gonna get nice and tender. I like to use a flat bottom spoon so you can just really get in there and chop it up. And then we're gonna toss and in that amount of time, the meat's gonna finish cooking through. The little pink bits we had on top. As you do this, like, there's gonna be some bits on the pan that are kind of stuck. You're kind of developing a little bit of fawn, which is the key to flavor. So just use your spoon to kind of scrape it up. There's a lot of moisture on the surface of the meat and from the onions, and that's gonna help you scrape up any like tasty, tasty brown bits. And you just keep breaking it up. Another tool that's really useful for breaking up brown meat is a potato masher. I actually don't like my potato masher for potatoes at all. I use it exclusively for ground meat. Our meat's all broken up. The spices are smelling really aromatic. Onion and garlic is tender. Some of the spices are sticking, which is just what you want. That's how you know that they're getting some direct heat. And now we're gonna add some beans. So taco salad, taco meat, always is like a tiny, tiny bit saucy. So we're gonna get that sauciness from our bean liquid. This is just canned beans, but if you've made your own beans, whoa. I'm actually gonna turn off the heat right now because the pan is plenty hot and I don't want to fully evaporate that bean liquid. A lot of um, taco seasoning that you buy has cornstarch in it, so it helps give you like that saucy vibe, but since we're adding the beans and we got that starchy liquid, this is gonna give us the same thing. I did add quite a bit of salt and the beans are canned, so they have salt, so we might be good. You always gotta let it cool down a bit because think about temperature affects taste. So if you're tasting something piping hot, it's gonna have one taste, so you wanna get it to the temperature that you're gonna eat it. Needs a bit of salt. I love taco salad. I love it. This is something I like to make all the time with any kind of meat, even with crumbled tofu if you don't want meat, or even just beans. This is actually one of my favorite recipes. I've made it a lot. Okay, we'll assemble. I like to start with a base of Fritos, lightly crushed. Okay. Now our meat evenly across the Fritos, almost like a little Frito pie vibe. I found that Colby actually tastes the most like Taco Bell. Okay, we tried Monterey Jack, we tried cheddar, we tried, we tried like the Mexican blend, but Colby is the one that really just gives me that solid Taco Bell vibe. Now we're gonna go crazy with our salad stuff. I love iceberg. We want a lot, a lot of nice crunch. For like the full Taco Bell journey, you want kind of underripe tomatoes. Out of season, winter plum tomatoes. Okay, I like to get in there and mix it up. You wanna make sure you get everything. Whoa. That's perfect, I love it, no notes. Now I'm gonna show you how to make beef suya using short rib. So short rib is considered a tough cut. That means it comes from a part of the animal where it does a little bit more work. Typically, you know, in, in, in French cuisine, when you think about a tough cut like short rib, it's cooked low and slow and like braised to break down all that collagen. You don't actually have to cook it low and slow. We're gonna cut and pound the short rib, which allows us to cook it hot and fast and it'll still be tender. You see this method a lot with Korean food, with like kalbi, where short rib is cross cut and then cooked over high heat, so it's still really tender. But tough cuts really can go both ways as long as you treat them properly, cut them appropriately, and uh, give them a marinade like we're gonna do today. So this beef suya recipe is by Yowande, and it's part of her 10 essential Nigerian recipes. And it is traditionally made with tozo, which is a fatty rump from a zebu, but 
Short rib is an excellent substitute. This is her take on it, and the key to its flavor is something called yaji, which is the suya spice. So we're gonna start with some dry roasted peanuts that have been ground. You can either buy these already ground or just take some peanuts, dry roast them, and then blitz them up in a spice grinder. Peanuts have a lot of fat, just like any nut, so if you blitz it for too long, it'll turn into peanut butter. So just go for like a delicate pulse until you end up with a fine powder like that. And we're gonna whisk this up with a little bit of ground ginger, cayenne for some heat, paprika, garlic and onion powder, and some fine salt. And this is gonna be our spice blend. Now, to make our marinade, I'm gonna mix up two tablespoons of this with some peanut oil, a little grated garlic, and grated ginger. So these are all ingredients that you've got access to, but it's fun how when you mix it in a new combination, you got a brand new flavor. Okay, so now that we have our marinade, I'm gonna show you how we're gonna slice and pound our meat. So here's my boneless short rib. You wanna go for something nice and thick because it'll give us a little bit of room for slicing it. This is also called a Denver steak. It's one of my favorite steaks because it is very flavorful. It's a little bit on the tough side and you've gotta cook it like a bit more rare slash medium rare. We put it in the freezer for just like 30 minutes because it makes it a little bit easier to slice. We want about half an inch thick per slice, so I'm gonna cut each one of these into three. And long, even strokes will ensure that you'll get a nice, even slice. If you go for like a sawing motion, that's when you can kind of tear up the meat. Also, don't freak out about it too much because we're skewering and grilling and it's all gonna be delicious. So we got our nice slices and we're gonna pound it thin. For pounding our meat, we're gonna line our board with some plastic. This is just gonna make sure it doesn't stick and tear. And we're gonna layer the meat between the plastic and give it a little smash with a rolling pin. Now don't get crazy here, because we don't want it to fall apart. It flattens really, really easily. Just gentle pressure, take your time. We're gonna take it thin without taking it so far that the fibers tear. Uh, if you don't have a rolling pin, you can also use a little skillet, um, but a rolling pin is just a little bit easier to control. Okay, so now that I've got my meat all nicely smashed, I'm gonna cut it into like skewerable pieces and we're gonna coat it in the marinade and it's gonna marinate overnight. Depending on like how long your skewers are, how big your grill pan is, you're gonna cut this down to work for you. If you're doing this outside on a grill, you probably could just skewer the whole thing but we're using an indoor grill pan, so it's a little bit too big. If it's a bit wide, you can just cut it in half this way. The thickness is what matters. How wide or, or skinny it is isn't gonna affect the way it cooks. So it's kind of like what works for your skewers, what works for your grill pan, and like what works for your mouth. So now I wanna make sure I really thoroughly coat this in the marinade, and I'm gonna also add a little bit of salt. I'm gonna get in there with my hands to make sure every single piece of meat is evenly coated. The marinade's gonna make this really, really flavorful. Don't be afraid to use your hands. A lot of times they're the best tool, especially for something like this because you want to make sure you get like every nook and cranny. If you were to just stir this up with a spoon, there's no way you're going to coat everything. You're going to be missing spots and you don't want a bland bite. So once this is evenly coated, you're going to plastic wrap this, pop it in the fridge overnight and let it marinate. But we marinated one yesterday so we can get to skewering and grilling faster. Huh? To skewer these, I've got some wooden skewers. You can also use metal, but when you're using wooden skewers, you do want to make sure that you soak them for at least 30 minutes or, you know, sometimes I plan and I'll do it overnight. The soaking's just going to make sure that when you put this on the grill, the skewers don't immediately burn. So to skewer these, if you've got like a wider piece like this, I would recommend doing double skewer. It just makes it a little bit easier to handle on the grill, especially when you're outside and it's really hot and you're just trying to flip as quickly as possible so your arm hairs don't burn off. This one's nice and narrow. We're just gonna use one. The how wide or narrow or short the meat is is gonna totally be up to your short rib. We had really nice thick cut short ribs so we're ending up with very wide pieces but oftentimes boneless short ribs depending on where they're cut from if it's further from the back of the cow, you're gonna end up with a much thinner piece, but it'll all work just fine here. Okay, so we're gonna be grilling indoors. So we've got a cast iron grill pan. And if you are new to grilling, this is a great place to start because we are just cooking 
over hot, direct heat. This is going to be hot and fast, so you don't have to worry about you know, banking your coals to one side. There isn't even that much heat management. You just want it to be hot. And I'm going to brush my skewers with oil just very lightly as they go on the grill pan. A grill pan doesn't work the same way as a grill because it's, the oil's going to collect in those little grooves and it's going to happen pretty quickly, the cooking. Crack open a window. Turn off your smoke alarm. Oh. oh boy. You know, sometimes that happens. And it's okay. I feel like this is gonna add to like the smoky flavor, you know? That authentic grill vibe. So much action. What you can't see on camera is all of these people <laughs> waving away the smoke because the fire alarm here is really intense. It sounds like it kind of sounds like a tornado warning. What's great with cooking thin cuts of meat like this is that we don't have to worry too much about internal temperature. It's really nice and thin, so once you get nice color on the outside, you're done. Let's see how we're looking. Ooh, huh? Sizzly? It's worth it. It's worth all the smoke. Those nice grill marks, some nice charring. Ooh, grilly, charry. It's a lot of action. Feels like it's getting crazy, but it, it happens fast. This is all the excitement I get in my life, you know? Guys, I think we did it. A successful day of meat. We're gonna sprinkle a little bit more of that suya spice. We're also gonna finish with some roasted peanuts. This is always a smart move. Anytime you're making something with nuts, make sure you garnish with nuts. And finally, we're gonna finish with some tomato and onion that's just been tossed with lime and salt and given some time to wilt. And like, I guess I would say, and now you're ready to party, but I feel like we partied through this whole recipe. I choose you. Okay. A nice balance of heat. It's not too intense because we got a good bit of richness from the peanuts. And what's incredible is just how tender the meat is because we cut it, we pounded it, we marinated it. It had some time with salt. This is so good. Everyone should have some. The steak is kind of like, this is a bit of a more advanced cooking technique, but we've been making so much together. We got eggs, we got rice, we got ground beef. You're ready for steak. I think with cooking a steak, using a thermometer is really vital because, you know, those, those old tests you've heard, there's like this old trick of, uh, depending on how you make a fist, that's the texture of the doneness of your steak. But it really doesn't work across all kinds of steak. So if your steak is grass-fed, grain-finished, or conventionally grown, the texture is going to be different. So I think that the best way is to use a thermometer. Steak is very expensive. We've got a really nice, well-marbled ribeye here. And you don't often cook a piece of meat like this, so I think it's important to do it the right way. We're going to do really simple steak and potatoes. So the first thing I'm going to do is have my little potatoes. I'm splitting them just so that they cook a little bit faster and they cook at the same time as the steak. If you want to round out this meal, throw a salad on the side. But I really like these potatoes with the steak because we're gonna butter baste our steak and then you have these really nice brown butter drippings that you don't want to go to waste so the potatoes are gonna soak it all up. Now the key to cooking your potatoes is you always want to start them in cold water. If you start your potatoes in hot or boiling water, what will happen is the outside's gonna get overcooked and the inside's gonna be undercooked. So if you want it to be even and creamy all the way through, you wanna start them in cold water. And I'm gonna add a generous amount of salt. You're gonna look at this and you're gonna think it's way too much salt. But remember, when you're cooking in water, most of that salt is gonna go right down the drain. And we're gonna start this on high, just to get the water to a simmer. And then you wanna knock it back to a gentle simmer. If you boil your potatoes, all the starches are gonna leach out and the potatoes are gonna get waterlogged and it's not gonna be creamy. I like to cook my steak in cast iron because cast iron retains heat really well. So when you put your cold steak on your cast iron pan, it's not gonna cool down. It's gonna stay really hot. You wanna get a really nice crust on the outside without overcooking the inside and a cast iron is the best way to do that. So I always preheat my cast iron on medium. Even if I'm gonna crank the heat later, it's good to start on medium just so it heats evenly all the way through. It's also really important to think about the size of your cast iron pan. You want your pan to be big enough to hold your steak, but not like huge. So if you have 
a steak this big and you use a pan this big, what's going to happen is all of the fat around here is just going to burn. If your pan is too small, you won't have room to like get in there and butter baste. If it's too big, the edges burn. So this is just right. We want a really nice brown, deep mahogany crust. And if you've been following along, what's the secret to brown? Dry. dry, correct. OK, so the first thing I'm going to do is pat my steak dry. This is already really nice and dry because it's so fresh, just cut. But get in there and make sure that it's totally freaking dry. You know that browning reaction, the Maillard reaction? It really only happens over like 300 degrees. And if there's moisture on the surface of something, the water is going to hinder how hot it can get. I've got a really nice one inch thick cut steak. I like to go for like between three quarters of an inch to one and a half. If you go a little thinner, it's often hard to develop a nice crust before the inside overcooks. And if you go thicker, it's a little bit hard to cook it through on the stove top. If you do want to cook like a three inch thick steak for like a holiday party, then I recommend either like reverse searing or finishing in the oven. But this is like the perfect size, I think, for two people on the stove top, really quick and easy. I know everyone likes all of their meat to be medium rare, but for a really fatty cut, just like this ribeye, this is controversial, but I prefer medium because I want to make sure I can render as much of that fat as possible. For like a leaner steak, like a bavette or a strip, I would go medium rare, but for a ribeye or any kind of Wagyu, very, very well marbled, like A5, I think, I think medium. You need more salt than you think, because once we get it in the pan, a lot of that salt's going to come off on the pan. Make sure we get all the sides of our food. You want to get those edges. Make sure you get that fat cap. And then you kind of just give it a tap to knock off any excess. Now, I don't put any spices at this point. I don't even like pepper, because we're going to be cooking it really hot. So if you add anything, the outside's just going to burn. For a steak this big, I don't like to dry brine. I find that a thinner steak like this it gets cured really fast. If I'm doing like a big prime rib or like a really big three inch ribeye for like a holiday party, then I'll dry brine. A bigger cut of meat can totally take it. But for something this thin, I do feel like the meat actually gets a bit tough from a dry brine. So we are going to cook. I'm going to use a neutral oil. I, I know some people like to add the oil onto the steak. I like to add the oil to the pan. I get a better crust. I'm here for that crust. And then once we get in there, I like to flip my steak every minute and a half. And what that means is I'm going to use a timer. So as soon as you add your fat, you want to add your steak because the pan's really hot. So if you don't move quickly, the fat will just catch on fire. Now lay your steak away from you so that you don't get any hot fat splatter. And we'll let the timer begin. Now while that's happening, use a spatula to press it down. Make sure you have full contact with the pan because that contact means browning. I know it's smoky and it's hot, but it's going to be worth it. I have an apartment without a hood and I do this. So you can too. First step, turn off your smoke alarm, open all the windows, turn on some fans and just accept that it's going to get smoky. And I think it's worth it. And you can see the edges are already getting really nice and caramelized and it has been a minute and a half, let's flip. Same thing, be really careful and do not plop it down. That fat's really hot, the last thing you want is for that to splatter on you. We're gonna cook this steak until we're about 25 degrees away from our target internal temperature. What's one and a half minutes plus one and a half minutes? Three minutes? Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's some math involved, we're flipping. <laughs> My final temp, I want to be 140 degrees, so at this point, I'm aiming for 115. And since we've done a minute and a half on each side, I'm ready to temp. So the best way to temp, lift it up, get into the side. This isn't a super thick steak, so we might already be close. If you've got a thicker steak, it's gonna take longer. We're at 115. Look at that. And we got really good color and it just took three minutes. Now I've turned off my pan. Before I add the butter, I actually want to get rid of this fat. It's just going to taste a little bit burnt because we were going so hot. So we're going to scrape this out. I'm going to add some thyme to flavor this fat. 
some garlic cloves, give them a quick smash. And then our steak's going back in the pan and we're gonna butter baste until we hit about 125. 10 more degrees. I like to put the herbs and everything on top. Now I'm gonna go for like about medium, medium low. We wanna be a little bit more gentle with the butter base so that our butter doesn't burn. We tilt our skillet and we scoop and we go. This is really fantastic for any protein, especially if you're cooking something where it's, you wanna make sure it's like cooking evenly. So if there's one side that's thicker than the other, make sure you hit that side with more butter or repeatedly baste that side a little bit more than the thinner side. It's also really good if you're cooking like something like a chicken breast, which naturally is not flat. The key to butter basting also is using a big spoon. If you do this with a little spoon, not only is it gonna take forever to scoop that butter and pour it over, but you're actually more likely to kind of burn yourself because you gotta get a little bit closer to the pan. And to make it a little easier to baste, I've moved the stick to one side so the fat kind of pulls on the other and it's easier to like do this little scoop and toss situation. It smells really good. Butter really carries the aroma of the thyme and the garlic and you can kind of use whatever herbs you feel like using here. It's really nice with woody herbs like rosemary and sage. If you've got a lot of herbs at home, just like throw a bouquet in there, you know? We lift. Look at that beautiful crust, huh? glistening with brown butter. 125? We were going for 130, that looks good. Wow. Now, I'm gonna rest my steak while I cook my potatoes. I'm gonna plop it on the cutting board. If you have a wire rack, that's even better. And we're gonna finish our potatoes in this brown butter, so none of it's gonna go to waste. Potatoes feel tendy. Okay, I'm gonna quickly drain these. Now, right in this pan, we're gonna take these potatoes add it to our buttery pan. There's so much flavor in this pan and we're not gonna let any of it go to waste. What's gonna happen is I'm gonna put all these potatoes cut side down and it's gonna soak up all that really tasty brown butter while our steak rests. Now how long your steak rests also de is determined by how thick your steak is. So this is relatively thin. We started out with a one inch thick steak. So it's only gonna need five minutes to rest. If you've got a big hunky steak, give it a little bit more time. You can over rest your steak where it just kind of starts to overcook at one point. So don't leave it there forever. While your steak rests, that's plenty of time for these potatoes to absorb all that delicious, delicious brown butter. If flipping all of these feels fussy to you, you don't have to, you can just toss it in the brown butter, do whatever your heart desires. But I like to kind of let it hang out like this. We're gonna turn the heat up a touch. I'm gonna add a little bit of water to like kind of create a quick pan sauce. And just from adding that water, and from like just the simmering action, it got a little bit creamy. I'm gonna let it simmer just a touch, and that's it. If you let it simmer for too long, it's gonna go back to being greasy. So let's plate this up, yeah? So I'm gonna just cut off the bone, and I like to gnaw on that. This is like a little treat. So you wanna cut your steak across the grain. Any steak is tough if you don't cut it properly. I don't like to cut my steak too thick, because it's a steak. You want it to be nice meaty bites, so don't get crazy here, you know? It's still a little pink. This is a nice medium, but all of the fat is rendered, which is what I like for a ribeye. And there you go. Really nice, easy beginner steak. I know it got a little crazy, it gets a little smoky, there's some flipping, you're getting a thermometer, but I don't know. I think it looks great. I think the craziest part is that the butter base is very quick, but you really do taste the thyme and the garlic in the steak. Nice crust, good amount of salt. Let's get the potatoes. Potatoes are really creamy nicely seasoned, and they're just like little butter sponges. And I love that you don't waste the butter that you're basting. This came together in like 20 minutes and you got a wonderful little date night meal. Leftover steak, I actually don't love reheating it because I feel like it gets very overcooked really fast. So instead, let's do a cold preparation. I think leftover steak is fantastic for a salad or today, I'm gonna show you to make a really simple steak sandwich. All right sandwich basics, right? You need a schmear. 
I'm going to do a little mix of mayo and horseradish. Oh, God. I love horseradish with steak, and I'm a big, big fan of mayo. And I'm just going to use some prepared horseradish and mix it in. If you can find freshly grated, that's cool. But I always keep prepared horseradish in the fridge. I'm going to add a little pepper to this, too. I want it to be chunky. And that's my saucy sauce. Now, for our steak. When it's in big pieces like this, it's a little bit hard to get through in a sandwich, so I'm going to slice them up a little bit thinner. This is all fat, which is not very delicious cold, so I'm going to trim off and remove the fat. You don't have to waste it. If you're cooking some vegetables or something like that, dice up that fat, add it to a cold pan, let it render out a bit, um, and then the little nuggets will get a little crisp. You'll get some of that beef fat in there and then throw in like a big handful of greens and a splash of water. Steam it down in there. You never have to waste good fat. It has so much flavor. A bias is one of my favorite ways to cut stuff, and it just means an extreme angle. If you were to cut it straight like this, you just kind of, you can't get to the end of it without hurting your fingies. So we're just gonna go at this angle. Just makes it a little bit easier. If you cooked your meat more on like the rare, medium rare side, you can also add it to like a hot soup, almost like pho style. Okay, that feels like a good amount for me for one sandwich. Got a nice crusty baguette. I want a thick center cut piece. I'll save the ends for ham. Little center cut filet of baguette. Let's add our lovely horseradish sauce. You can toast it if you want, but this is a really nice fresh baguette, so it's still crusty on the outside. You know, sandwich making does not get respect. It's very hard to get a well-made sandwich out there. There's an art to it. See how I'm taking my time? Edge-to-edge to edge coverage, very important. Little shingle of our meat, pile it on. Edge-to-edge edge coverage, baby. Now, I feel like you could stop here. Naked arugula. It's sad, so we're gonna dress it up a little bit. Little drizzle of olive oil. Dress your greens, baby. A little hit of lemon juice. When I'm at home and I'm not using a whole lemon, I just take, I choose your own adventure, cut off a cheek. You don't need to crack into the whole thing because it'll just dry out. And then this way, to store it in the fridge, I just, it's self-sealing. And a little hit of flaky salt. I feel like the best way to bring the two halves together is to just be brave. Be brave, be swift. Wow. Delightful. Thanks for going on this beef journey with me. I hope you've got some fun new techniques to go forth and beef. But beyond that, thanks for joining me on this Cooking 101 journey. Let us know if there's anything in particular you want to see next time, you know? What do you struggle with? What are the tips and tricks you need so you can be more confident in the kitchen and, you know, cook. That was great. And just like that. And just like that. <laughs>